Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, small business owners, sales professionals, business people of all sorts. Uh, We are enjoying inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to sort of all over the place. Um, And and I am tremendously grateful uh, for that and very aware that it is because of the guests who join me. Uh, These are folks with expertise in particular areas of business. And they join me to have a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you so that you can get answers, ideas, suggestions. Uh, You can find people who you uh, like what they have to say, and you can reach out to them later uh, to to get more information um, so you can be more successful and and do better things in your business. My guest today is Bradley Benner. Bradley is a self-proclaimed addict when it comes to digital marketing. He's the co-founder of Semantic Mastery, as well as owner and founder of Big Bamboo Marketing. With a unique skill set, Bradley provides digital marketers and business owners with the tools, training, and insights they need to make more money, get better clients, and work less. Together with his team at Semantic Mastery, Bradley consistently delivers proven, real-world, results-oriented training and business development tools. Thanks so much for joining me today, Bradley. Thank you, Diane, for having me. I am um, happy to have you join me. We're going to be talking about something that I don't believe I've ever had a conversation with on this podcast before about this subject. It's about Google tools. And, uh, and I think it's one of those things that people hear that they're supposed to use, uh, maybe they think it's expensive or they don't really know how or where to go or, you know, do they get to keep their information? I don't know. There's so many things I hear sort of swirling around this topic of uh, Google. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have you sort of cut through that and, and help us really understand uh, which tools are free and which ones we should be using and sure. that kind of thing. Well, that's that's a great question, and and I'm I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, you know, I've I've pretty much built my entire business using Google products, which is is crazy because <laughs> most of them are free, and uh, so you know I've 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 enjoyed that, and I I consider Google kind of a business partner of mine as opposed to just a you know service provider or something like that. So, um, and and it's interesting because when we were preparing or I was getting scheduled to come speak with you and your audience. Uh, things have changed just since then slightly in that what I was planning on talking about primarily was Google My Business platform, which people might consider to be Google Maps. Um, It was formerly Google Maps, but now in order to get your profile and your business onto Google Maps, you have to do it through the Google My Business platform. And it's uh, right now Google is actually trying to prevent a lot of spam listings or to eliminate a lot of spam listings. So there, I call it, I call it having an itchy trigger finger in that Google is uh, suspending a lot of valid genuine Google or businesses that are going in and making significant changes to their Google, my business profile. 
So I first want to just preface whatever I'm going to say today with, I don't recommend at this current time frame. It, this could change in a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of months. We don't, I don't actually work for Google, so I, I don't know when, but I want to just make sure that everybody is aware that I do not recommend going into your Google My Business profile currently and making any significant changes to any of your information. However, we can, we can still talk about some of the uh, things that you can do within your Google My Business profile to get better results. And then some of the other tools outside of Google My Business that you can also use to get better results and, and increase leads, um, create more brand recognition and that kind of thing. Does that make sense? It does, thank you for that. And so I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding that some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about, you would advise people wait a little bit before they actually do? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll, I'll okay. clearly d d um, you know, disclaim which ones those all right. are, all right? Okay. I, I, do, I yeah. do not want anybody coming back and saying that they tried to do something and their, their listing was suspended. And, and honestly, I've, uh, I've actually experienced that with some valid businesses, and it's, it's just a real bloodbath wow. out there right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well. and you know, the unfortunate thing is, is Google is proprietary, so they're able to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and, uh, and we're kind of at their mercy, and that's, that's – that, that's an unfortunate thing because it can be such a great source of leads for a business. Yeah, right, right. So. But this is part of the tricky part of it is that, uh, you know, sometimes you just, I mean, I think that would really trip somebody up if all of a sudden they, uh, they had a totally legitimate business and, and they were suspended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah oh. And it's, and so again, I, you know, I, I just want to caution everybody now. So I am going to still share with you some, some, some things that you can do as business owners um, specifically that will help you to generate leads that aren't causing any issues right now. Uh, and, and those I would suggest that you actually implement, you know, ASAP as soon as possible, because they're very, very effective, whether you're a local business, which most people think of having a Google maps listing, which again is now Google My Business profile, and I'm, I'm going to call it GMB for short. Uh, okay. But most people will uh, consider having a GMB profile or a maps listing as something that only local businesses do, like businesses that only serve a local customer base. But that's not necessarily true. Even national businesses or even international businesses have an actual physical location somewhere. And there's no reason why they shouldn't register as a, you know, their, their GMB or Google My Business profile, because that actually helps to create more authority and what's called validate the entity in Google's eyes. In other words, it helps to tell Google that it's a real and genuine business. And it's kind of like, it kind of like elevates the business in Google's eyes and gives it a little bit more authority and a little bit more exposure just from having that claimed and verified profile. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. So for those of you that, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Keep going. So for those of the, those of you out that are listening that do not, have not claimed and verified your Google My Business profile, I would recommend that you do. And here's the thing. As I said before, there are certain things that I would not do. So if you're an existing business that has a claimed and verified profile, I don't recommend going in and optimizing, uh, you know, completing the profile if it's not already been completed or changing anything significantly within the profile. And what I mean by that is once you're inside the dashboard, which you can, you can go to find it by just going to business.google.com, right? That's going to take you directly to your Google My Business dashboard. If you're logged into the account where the, the profile has been claimed under, then you'll see it right away and you can start to, you know, edit different elements of the profile. But primarily, the, the most important one is going to be the in, information tab or the info tab on the left sidebar. And that's where you're, you put in your company's information, your, your name, your phone number, your website, your hours of operation, a description. Uh, if you're a service area business, like most contractors would be, which is primarily what my business is, is you know, catering to contractors. Um, you know, obviously, like a plumber goes to a customer location instead of the customer coming to the plumber's location. So, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's what's called a service area business. You can set your service areas and that kind of thing within there. Now, that specifically, if you already have that somewhat filled out, leave it alone. <laughs> because, uh, and if you, don't, if, if, if you don't have it filled out, but it's, you've had a claimed and verified business, I wouldn't go in and start optimizing that or filling that out now. I would, I would wait, give it some time uh, until Google decides to, you know, ease up a bit on, on what they're doing currently. 
But if you are just claiming a profile for the first time, then feel free. If you, for example, if you go in and try to set up a listing, um, or it might even be a listing on the web, but it's never been claimed for your business, you can actually request to claim it. Typically what Google will do is we'll send you a postcard to that physical location that's listed in that, that you know, that's um, published in that listing. And so that you, and it'll contain a pin, a, a, a code that you're going to insert to tell Google that you do indeed, your business does indeed reside there and that you were able to receive mail and that's how you verify it. That's typically how it happens. And once you've verified the profile, then you can make the changes. Um, and you can do all that rather quickly, I'd say within a couple of days, because it's, it's natural, it's logical for somebody that has just claimed a profile for them to complete it. Where I'm seeing the problem is if people have had existing businesses and they go in and they start making any sort of significant changes or fully, fully completing a profile that has only been partially complete up until that point. Um, and that's where I'm seeing some, and, and you know, this is kind of a, 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 a wide reaching uh, problem right now, but we're seeing some legitimate businesses get suspended, their, their Google listing gets suspended. So again, I would recommend wow. highly against trying to do anything significant to that. However, I don't want to scare anybody because it, it, the, the Google My Business profile can be very, very powerful, even if it's not fully optimized, in that there is a feature in there, and a lot of businesses don't know this, but there's, uh, they, they real, rolled this out about a year ago, and it's called the Google My Business Posts. So again, once you're inside your dashboard, then on the left-hand side, you'll see the navigation menu essentially. And there's uh, one of the, the tabs on that is called posts. And if you click on that, it allows you to post directly through Google My Business. So you're posting directly to Google through your Google profile, uh, your business profile. And it's almost like a Facebook post would be, okay? Or another social media platform. So you can publish with images and or videos uh, and then also include text and then you can have calls to action like, you know, um, a phone number and it, and it can be a call button. Most of these posts are designed to really be viewed on mobile devices. So it's a tap to call button uh, or it can be a, like a learn more button, which can be a link to your website or a specific page or a blog post on your website or, you know, anything that you want to link to directly to send traffic to. And so those posts right there, that is what you can do right now that I highly okay. recommend it because a lot of businesses are don't either don't know that posting is available or exists, or they're just not sure how to use it or if it's going to provide any benefit. And I can tell you whether, again, if you're a local business, it can provide an enormous amount of benefit. It can really help you to generate more leads from Google. Even if you are a regional or national business or even a global business for that matter, it's still, once again, you're, you're, giving Google exactly what it wants when you publish often and frequently and, and regularly uh, because Google loves fresh content and it means that you're engaged with your profile. And again, Google will um, elevate your exposure, right? Give you more exposure because you're doing what it, what it wants to and you're using the tools that it provides to you. Whereas most of your competitors probably are unaware that it exists and are, or, or just are flat out not using them. So, yeah. So what's interesting about it is, you know, Facebook, I'm not much of a Facebook, I'm a digital marketer, but I'm not much of a Facebook marketer. I have a team member that handles all that stuff for me. But if anybody has ever tried marketing their business on Facebook, you probably are already aware that Facebook a long time ago worked into their specific algorithm. When you make a post on your page, your, your business page, uh, promoting something for, for your business, if it's just a page, a, a post that, you know, tries to get engagement from people and it doesn't contain an external link that would take people off of Facebook when they click on it, you'll get that pay, that post will get much more exposure, much more reach to your Facebook followers. As soon as you post an external link in that, all of a sudden your exposure, so in other words, the, the post itself won't get shown to but a very, very small percentage of your page followers. And it's because Facebook doesn't want people to be clicking on whatever link it is that you posted in there and being and, and taken off of their platform because then they can't serve them ads, right? So, <laughs> so Facebook a long time ago um, developed that into their algorithm to where the moment that you put some sort of external call to action in a post, it, it significantly restricts your exposure to where very few eyeballs will actually ever see that post. And it's, it's, and it was smart on their part, but it's frustrating to marketers, obviously, and to business owners. 
Well, consider what Google's always been. Google has always been a search engine that provides an, a, an indexed results page, like a, re, a results page full of indexed URLs or links that take people to external websites off of Google. And so right. when Google developed this Google My Business Pro, um, platform and, and started imp, you know, giving all of these tools available for businesses to use, it was with the, the sheer intention to keep Google users within the Google ecosystem. So that's why I'm saying if you actually use things like the Google My Business Post, now you can do the same thing that your blog could do, for example, where you could do content marketing directly through your Google profile and publish po often and regularly. And when people do a search for particular keywords, for example, uh, your business, po your GMB posts could be shown because Google loves to promote its own platform, its own websites more than it does others. And then when somebody clicks on it, it's going to open it up, open up another Google, uh, you know, the, the post it expands or, or it fills up a whole screen on a mobile device. If it's on a, a desktop, you'll see that it kind of grays out the background and expands and it keeps people within the Google ecosystem, which, so again, they're, they're kind of following suit of what fr Facebook has always been doing. Does that make sense? Yes. That's fascinating. I did not realize that Facebook was doing that. I mean, I knew that, that views had dramatically dropped. I didn't realize the external link thing mm -hmm. and sharing that then it, it just helps it make perfect sense that Google would want to do it because that's who they are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, if you think about it, when you, especially searches with local intent, so search queries with local intent, like, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit here about some of the keywords that, that you can target specifically within your post to get more results as a local business. But you can apply these strategies again, even to a national business. Um, but if you take, if you do a, a search for like, you know, a uh, pet store near me, and, and near me, yeah. key, near me modifiers are incredibly powerful. And when I say near me, I, I, there's there's variations of those near me modifiers. So, for example, you could say pet store near me, or uh, restaurants in my area, or tree services close to me, or close by, or nearby. Like those are all type of what I call near me keywords. And for mobile search mobile searches which is about seven out of all ten uh, of, out of ten searches with local intent now are performed on a mobile device and so those near me search modifiers drive a heck of a lot of traffic an enormous amount of, of traffic within google and here's why i think about this when you pick up your mobile device and i know you all can either t test this right now or just envision it in your head but when you grab your mobile device and you start to type in a search query or even speak if you speak in a search query, it's a little bit different. But if you start to type in a search query on Google uh, from your mobile device, what happens? Half the screen gets taken up by your keyboard, and the other half of the screen gets taken up by suggested search queries, yeah. right? And yeah. so what happens is Google is suggesting these near me search queries. So if you start to type in plumber or pet store or restaurant or Mexican food or whatever the case may be, you'll see that Google will suggest near me or some very close right. um, variant of that. And right. that's typically one of the very first suggestions. So people just tap on it. It's like Google is training us how to search because they yeah. give us suggestions, right? And so if you know that, you can actually use that to your advantage. And here, here, here's another thing. And how did I discover this? Well, in the, in the Google My Business uh, dashboard, once again, one of the tabs on the left-hand sidebar is called Insights. And Insights is like Google Analytics for the, the Google My Business profile. So you can, you can actually click on that and you'll see what kind of search queries has given your maps uh, listing exposure. And, you know, and, and, and from there, you, what I found was about a year ago or so, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago, that through all the clients that I service, most of them are contractors again, but I started seeing these near me search phrases and, and again, variations of those showing up over and over and over again and driving 40% or more of all the traffic and engagement to that Google profile were coming from these near me search queries. And so it was really interesting. And I said, okay, well, how can we utilize that to our advantage? And it's almost like Google gives us the, the keys to the kingdom because when you, when you, you can go in your insights and see what type of queries are, are, are giving your listing exposure and then select the ones that are relevant put them into a spreadsheet or a notepad file or something like that, and then use that in your content marketing for your GMB posts. 
And ha so, so if you work those keywords or those search queries directly into, especially the first line of the post, the text part portion of the post, again, they're very image and or video driven posts, but you can put text in there up to 1500 characters. So one of the things that I've always recommended doing, and I've seen incredible results for this, especially for local stuff, is when is if you use the, the near me search queries in that first line of text, well, how do you do that to where it reads properly? Very simply, like if it's plumber near me, for example, you could type in um, as the first line of text, did you just search for, and then put in quotes, plumber near me, question mark. Well, look no further because Joe's Plumbing provides, you know, plumbing services in the Fairfax, Virginia area or whatever. So now you've not only worked in that keyword that has given your listing some exposure, but you know people are searching for because Google is training us how to search with its suggested search queries. But you can also give the call to action and work in your location modifiers, such as like whatever town or city that you service. So you can say we provide plumbing services such as drain cleaning and water heater repair in the Fairfax, Virginia area, if that makes sense. So, you know, you can start to work in these additional keywords that you want to get more exposure from. And if you do that consistently and regularly over time, uh, you know, what happens is Google will start to provide you exposure for those search queries in those areas that you're mentioning so that you can start to siphon traffic from other areas, even outside of your immediate area where the, your maps listings would show. Does that make sense? It does. So that's crazy. Yeah. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, you can do the same sort of thing, even like I said, with, you're not just a local business, I, I primarily deal with local businesses, but yeah. even businesses that serve a much wider area or, or national businesses can still utilize that and utilize the power of Google's own properties to help promote their organic SEO rankings, which, you know, typically a business that um, doesn't serve just a local market, they're, they're looking to get ranked in the organic section, which are essentially the links underneath maps. And a lot of times search queries that are not, do not, are not, um, do not contain local intent or have local intent are obviously not going to show a maps listing in the search results. And that's good. You can still utilize Google My Business to even help promote those because once again, in, in those posts, you can, there's um, the ability to add a call to action button. And within the call to action button, you can link to whatever you want. So let's say you're a national business uh, or, you know, again, again, could even be global, but a national business that has a headquarters somewhere. So claim and optimize that profile, even internet based businesses, right? Like strictly internet. I'm sure you have plenty of entrepreneurs that listen to your podcast yeah. that just work from home that have internet, you know, online businesses alone. Well, they still have an office might be their home, but why not create a, a local business listing out of that and create the service area of the United States, for example, make it a service area business because you don't want customers knowing what your address is obviously for like an, an online business. So you could still claim and optimize a Google my business profile and call it a service area business for a national online business. Right. And then hide. And what happens is with the service area business, it actually hides the street address. It would just list in the maps listing, the business name, city, state, and zip, but it won't show the street address. And so that's a good thing because now you can use that Google my business profile to create these posts regularly and consistently uh, that you can link to your product pages, for example, or, uh, you know, whatever you're trying to generate leads to. And now you're using a Google property to produce backlinks, which is an important part of SEO, to your most important pages on your website. And even if you're not trying to serve a local market specifically, you're still going to get the benefit of that consistency and those backlinks from Google. And it actually will help your organic SEO. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I I'm taking so many notes because... <laughs> When we're done, I'm going to be going and doing all this. <laughs> I love this. This is incredible. Great. Okay. So uh, are there other free Google services that or tools that we haven't touched on yet? Well, there are. Um, some, some are a bit more complex in that, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there are, for example, okay. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Google Drive, which – you know, yeah. Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Slides and uh, you, there's Google Drawings and there's all, all kinds of cool stuff that you can do with Google Drive. And you can actually use those. Once again, they're Google properties. You can actually create um, 
you know, marketing messages, marketing pieces within Google Drive using like, for example, Google Docs and Google Drawings and, and Google Slides and make presentations that contain links to your most important pages, uh, product pages or service area, you know, service pages that, you know, for again, local businesses, they could link to like, you know, if a plumber does plumbing and HVAC, they could have Google Docs that are that, that can be made really, really nice, like to look nice and, and, and actually convert a, a potential visitor to those Google Docs and actually link over to those pages on their site. You can insert images into Google Docs that are like banners or like ads almost, like banner ads. Um, so, and it's funny because if you set those permissions for those files within Google Drive to public, for anybody to view on the web. So again, if anybody's, if you're familiar with Google Drive, you probably are aware you can share docs with other people that they can collaborate. You can make them public for people to view only, but those are indexable documents now. And so what's interesting is you can actually build a whole marketing system out of Google Drive files, all the various types of files and use that because once again, it's Google to help link back to your, not only your primary website, but all of your, what I call tier one branded profiles, which would be like your major social media profiles. Uh, if you're a business, a local business, you're, you're typically going to have what's called citations. You're going to be listed in business directories like Yelp, for example, and yellow pages and that kind of stuff. Um, if you have external blogs like wordpress.com, blogger, Tumblr, anything like that, you could link to those, um, you know, and actually create these really well made to look very well. Uh, Google Drive files that are made public on the web indexable and now what you're doing is once again you're you're using Google to actually siphon some authority from the Google domain to push back through to your your branded entity and your assets and it's incredibly powerful and uh, and a lot of people don't know that you can use Google Drive in that way as an SEO tool but we've been doing it since 2015 and um, just seen incredible results and it still works four years later Wow I had no idea. Yeah. And so another free tool that I can give you an example on is a, with the Google Sites. So sites.google.com is the domain for that. Um, and you can go create a free Google website. You can, there's a classic version and there's a newer version, which is like HTML5. It's, uh, you know, pretty much drag and drop uh, site builder. But once again, it's a free Google product. And there's no reason why you can't or shouldn't go create a site that mirrors your main website, whatever's on your main, you know, your main domain website. You can create one that just what I, we call it theme mirroring, but you can mirror your Google site. We call them G sites for short to match what is on your main site. And now once, and then once again, you link. So for example, if you've got, you know, let's say you've got four product categories on your main website, and then you might have some pages within those categories and then maybe you do some blog posting and things like that. You don't have to, I wouldn't mirror all of your posts, but I would mirror all of your important pages on your website onto a G site. And you can literally copy and paste the exact same text and images and everything and put it on a Google site and then link from those pages directly over to the corresponding page on your money site, your, 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 your primary domain. And now what you've got is a Google site that is, once again, you're transferring authority from Google back to your main site. And now you can do some of, you know, a external SEO. So like link building and things that typically you would only want an SEO professional to do, because if you don't know what you're doing with link building, you could actually cause some harm. Um, you could catch a penalty, that kind of stuff. But when you're using the Google products and Google sites and Google drive files, like I just mentioned, you can use those as kind of buffers or what we call an SEO firewall that you, you surround and it's almost like you build a cocoon around your, your primary domain using Google products. And then you do all of your external SEO stuff to those Google products, those tier one assets, as opposed to directly to your primary domain. And it causes them, uh, you know, it, it allows you to push authority and what's called link equity back to your, your primary site without running the risk of causing any harm, which up until, like I said, until, until you've, and, and until now, you probably have been told not to do any sort of crazy link building and things like that to your primary domain because it could cut, cause penalty within Google. And, and you're right. But right. when you insulate your primary domain away from things using Google properties, remember, Google's not going to punish itself. <laughs> so, so you can use that to your advantage. Wow. This, this is uh, really, this is incredible. Thank you. 
Uh, so, seriously. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's very important. And so some of the other things that, you know, pretty cool things that you can do with that is once you, if you, if you mirror, so, you know, we, again, we call it theme mirroring, mirror your Google site or your G site to your primary domain, whatever your website is. And, and uh, you know, that, that can take some work, but you can hire somebody in house to do that. Um, you know, if you have virtual assistants or somebody that actually handles web development and stuff, that's something you could task them to do. And then the same thing goes with the, the Google Drive files that I was just talking about. You can actually go in and create a, a, a folder within Google Drive and brand it. So name, call it whatever the name brand of your company is and make that folder public. So it's indexable on the web. It's only it's view only for everybody, except for the people that you've given permission to, you know, edit. But it's publicly uh, uh, viewable, and which means it's indexable. Na name it after your company name, and then all of the files and folders that are contained within that folder will now also be public. And then what you can do is actually create separate folders for each one of those pages on your website. That so it's, again, it's mirroring your theme, mirroring the the primary category pages or service categories if you're a service type business uh, in folders, and then you create again those indi individual files such as Google Sheets, Google Docs, Google Drawings, Google Slides, um, all of those within each one of those particular folders that are now mirrored after the pages on your site, and you target the same types of keywords and products and things to where you're essentially promoting your products or services in what's called silos or categories that are those folders within that primary folder that every one of those are indexable. And remember, always link back from those properties, whether it's the Google Drive files or the G site, to the pages that they're mirroring on the primary site. And then lastly, and here's the kicker, if you actually, those drive files can actually be embedded. You can embed drive files into the Google site. So what you do is you create this kind of like a picture in picture tunnel, like a never, it's, it's almost like if you've ever seen two mirrors that are facing each other and you stand between them and you look at it and you can just see the mirror images get, you know, they just repeat over and over and over and keep getting smaller. And it's like a tunnel and like a never ending tunnel. That's yeah. kind of what you're doing here with Google properties is you create the G site that's mirrored to your money site or, you know, again, it's your primary domain. We call it money site. Then you create the Google drive folders and files and then you embed the drive files into the G site. So the same, the mirrored pages or files will, will be embedded in the mirrored pages on the G site. All of those are pointing back to your money site. And so you've created this like tunnel and tunnel that the Google bots or spiders, they, they go crawl these links and they get stuck in this tunnel and it just keeps looping around back and back, back and forth. And it builds all this relevance and authority. And again, it's incredibly powerful for SEO. It's, Again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this stuff, but it's, it's, it really is powerful. And um, some of the things that you can do using Google's own properties, that everything that I just mentioned is 100% free. It's just a matter of wow. putting it together. Wow. <clears throat> it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. I have to take a quick sponsor break, and then I want to continue on with this <clears throat> Excuse me, conversation. Sure. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Do Business Better by Damian Mason, and Breathe to Succeed by Sandy Abrams. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Bradley Benner about using free Google to, tools to grow your business. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I my question for you is this. I mean, I, these are incredible. Uh, they are absolutely incredible. Do you think small business owners should be doing this in-house, you know, doing it themselves or with, you know, with a staff member, or should they be outsourcing it to a vendor or an agency? Great question. I really actually really appreciate that question too, because, all right, here's my thoughts on this. If you have somebody that in-house that handles some of the marketing then, then absolutely it can be done in-house, but you got to provide them with the proper training to do it. 
again, I, as a, as a, as an agency owner, as well as an instructor, um, I can tell you that a lot of the times I, when I, when I take on a new client, for example, that has said, you know, oh, well, we've got somebody that handles this or that. They may be doing stuff like doing activity, you know, but they're not uh-huh. really fully trained on how to make it all work or to put the pieces together properly. And it's not their fault. They just have never been trained properly. And so again, uh, if you're doing, if you have somebody in house, absolutely keep it in house because it will reduce your cost, but make sure that you're providing them with the proper education to know how to do this kind of stuff. That's number one. Number two, if you don't already have somebody in house, then it, a lot of times as a business owner and, and usually smaller businesses, obviously that, you know, solopreneurs or very small business owners that are a, a lot of times the owners are, are, are doing a lot of the, you know, the, the tasks within their business themselves. A lot, yeah. And I don't, I don't recommend that you try to take the time to learn all this stuff um, because you're better off focusing on growing your business, you know, running and managing and operating your business and, and working on growth instead of the, you know, the getting into the weeds of, of the marketing and, and, the, and the grunt work. Um, so in that case, I would recommend that you either hire an agency or a consultant. And, and I kind of have some thoughts about that as well. Uh, right. Or find a third-party provider, a vendor that can provide these done-for-you services. Um, that that I think is it, as long as you understand what it is that you want done, and then you can actually order them, or, or again, even have somebody in-house handle that to where they know what to order and in what you know sequence and that kind of stuff in order to get the best results. If you're going to hire an agency, which is certainly one of the you know recommendations in my uh, that that I would recommend for businesses to do, because that way it really it takes the load off of the business to, to do that themselves. I, I do recommend hiring a local consultant, local to you, or they don't have to, they don't necessarily have to be local, but um, you know, hiring a smaller consulting firm instead of a large agency. And the reason I say that is because I've been in this business a long time now going on 10 years and I've seen a lot of my own clients that have come from, you know, had, had experiences with larger agencies and I'm, I'm not, I can't paint with a too broad of a brush. There are certainly good ones out there, but a lot of the times with larger agencies, they treat their clients as commodities, another number, another source of revenue, and they don't really provide customized marketing solutions particular to that business or specific to that business. And I found that a lot of the times they get lackluster results, but they charge higher fees because they are, you know, they have more overhead, more staff, more, you know, more employees, all that kind of stuff. And so I have found through these years that hiring a more personal, like smaller type of consultant that is going to produce, you know, provide more individualized attention, more customized marketing solutions for whatever business they're, they're, they're providing the, the marketing for, um, you tend to get much better results. And so again, if you're going to hire an agency and or a consultant, I would recommend sticking with a smaller firm that's going to give you more personal attention where you're not treated so much as a commodity. Again, if you can go to a, an agency website, and, and, and this is my opinion, but if you can go to an agency website and see like packages that you could just select from, you're probably not going to be served very well by them because one size does not fit all. Um, they may think it does, but it really doesn't. And in my, in my experience, I have found that hiring or, or being able to find out, have a conversation with the business owner about what their marketing needs are, who their customers are, what, you know, what, what, what drives the, what the hot buttons are, the pain points, that kind of stuff, really listening, asking questions and listening, and then developing a customized marketing proposal around that, a marketing plan, I should say, around that. And then implementing that typically gets much better results. Okay, I, I cannot even begin to tell you how much I appreciate that information. And I want to take it like a little step further. If someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, I get it. That all makes sense to me. Um, what are, and they're going to go look for a local agency. So other than the packages, are there other things they should look for? Are there questions that they should ask? Because there's so many companies out there saying they do the stuff that, I'm not really necessarily sure they do. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I would say that, you know, when you interview uh, a potential vendor or an agency, a marketing consultant, whichever it may be, uh, that one of the questions that you should ask is, you know, do you provide customized solutions? That's a very quick and simple way to kind of, you know, weed out the, the those that are that, that say that they have, you know, boxed solutions that just work all the time, because I found that not to be the case. Now, if you're dealing with a boutique agency, right? So an agency that caters only to a specific industry or business vertical, 
that's different because they, they have developed marketing programs that work very, very well for that particular business vertical, right? That industry. Those, yeah. I, I, th that, that's a good choice, by the way. You're typically going to pay a premium for that, but they, are, they, they understand that market or the business's customer market very, very well. They, they, under, they, they speak their language. They know the vocabulary. They know what the customers are looking for for that particular business type, um, where the pain points are, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they've developed all these marketing collateral around that particular industry. So again, going to a boutique agency is, is, a, is a fantastic way. You're, you're going to pay a premium for that, but it's a great way to get really good results that are, so you can find boxed solutions with those type of providers. But for the me too agencies, <laughs> right? The, the, the more general type agencies that will deal with just about any type of business that will talk with them. I found that if they have box solutions, it's a bad thing. So one of the things that I would recommend is just very simply is just say, do you provide customized marketing proposals? And if the, if they say yes, then that's, that's a good indication. And when having that conversation, pay attention to whoever it is that you're speaking with. And if they're asking a lot of questions about your business and letting you do the talking, you being the business owner, then you've probably found a really good, at least potentially a good yeah. provider. Um, because it's not about, it's not about what the agency knows and how, you know, how much knowledge they have in marketing or, or, or big SEO words and all that kind of stuff. It's not about that. It's about the agency asking questions and letting the, the business owner speak so that they can identify what will work for them. Does that make sense? Completely. <clears throat> I, I especially appreciate that because um, that, that is, so my belief system that the seller should not be talking. They should be going through discovery. You know, right. they should be finding out as much as they can. So I agree. I think that's a great way to see if someone um, is potentially, you know, good in right. that field. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. So do you recommend any other methods for growing a business? Are there other suggestions that you would have for the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. And a couple, and, and once again, I'm going to go back to Google. I'm primarily the Google guy. Some of my other partners deal with uh, some of the other platforms, but um, I've, I've always really stuck to Google stuff. And so that would include YouTube. Um, I think businesses should be using YouTube. There's a ton of traffic on YouTube and, and the younger audiences like millennials and, 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 you know, younger than that are not really watching a lot of, you know, network or programmed TV anymore. They're watching stuff on demand. There's a lot of YouTube being watched. And so, you can actually, and what's great about it is, um, you know, obviously video type advertising in the past had been like shotgun approach where you would buy airtime and you would just show a, a really expensive 30 second air spot to everybody within a particular geographic region or whatever, whether they were interested or not. You had no idea. You were just showing it. You were paying a lot for the exposure, but you don't know who was really watching with current me media the way that it is, uh, you know, especially YouTube, you can really target to where only people are going to see your ad that are likely to engage with it or to be interested in it. The targeting has be within the YouTube ads platform, what's the Google ads platform, formerly Google AdWords, it's now called Google ads, but that includes search marketing or search PPC pay-per-click. That also includes YouTube uh, advertising as well as the display network, which are the banner ads uh, that are almost on every website in the world. Um, and you can manage all of that from the Google ads dashboard. And then within YouTube, within the last year and a half or so, they have gotten so much better targeting. It used to be that Facebook was the best for targeting, uh, you know, demographics and interests and, you know, that kind of stuff. But now uh, Google is catching up and uh, YouTube especially to where you can create, you know, if you're not into creating your, by the way, some of the videos that you can create as even as a business owner or people on staff, for example, with their mobile devices are actually really good videos for, you know, just getting your message out over buying a really polished, well-produced video, because I think kind of the market has shifted in that the you know, you know, internet users are and consumers um, react better and engage better with more genuine real type videos than these over polished, like marketing messages. And so you can, even on a shoestring budget, you can really get some good results with just, you know, a mobile device video, um, trying to get messages out or speak about what your brand is and who you are, what your vision is as a business or a company, things like that. And then just put that stuff out on the web on YouTube and find 
audiences that are interested in that kind of thing and use the targeting options inside of the Google Ads dashboard to, to really get that video in front of people that may very well be or likely interested in what you have. And there are a few different audience types of, uh, that you can select. You can select by geography, which is great, which means you can only show, the, the video will only show to YouTube users that are within a specific geographic area and you can target a, a, cool. all the way down to a zip code, um, a, 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 a city, a region, a county, a state, nationally, globally, or by country, however you wanna do it. So you can really zero in geographically um, or what's called geotargeting, or you can also, and you can also uh, target by, you know, topics. So in other words, like if somebody's looking at, you know, cat videos on YouTube and you sell cat products or you're a pet store, for example, you could have your, your ads potentially play in front of anybody within a specific geographic area that is watching cat videos because it's still, it's topically related. However, you can also use what they call interest targeting. And interest targeting is because Google knows, just like Facebook does, who we are and what we do, what we like, where we go, what we eat, what time we wake up. You know, they know all this stuff about us. So you can select, you know, people that have shown an interest in cats, for example, or pets or whatever. And so it doesn't matter whether they're watching cat videos or if they're watching sports highlights on YouTube. The, Google knows that individual, that viewer is, a, is interested in cats so your, your ad about your cat products or your pet store or whatever could play directly to them, even if they're not watching a topically related video, because there's still a very good chance that they're going to be interested in that. So my point is you can use these different targeting options to really zero into the specific audience that is most likely to engage with your ad and click back to your website and, you know, become a lead or, you know, call or contact you or whatever the case may, whatever your call to action or conversion goal is. So it's very, very important. And, and I think YouTube, by the way, YouTube ads are so inexpensive. It's incredible compared to something like search ads, which are rather expensive, very effective, but rather expensive. YouTube ads are incredibly inexpensive. Um, and you can with a, I mean, just a small budget for branding campaigns, for example, having a video just talking about who your business is and what it's about, you know, what you're, what, you know, why not, not necessarily like touting like why you're awesome or whatever, but like just who the business is. And, and for example, I've got a roofing client that he's one of the highest rated uh, roofing roofers in, in, in the Virginia area, Northern Virginia, especially. And so we have a YouTube ad that was done. That was by another company that was rated him best of the best roofer in, in Virginia. And it's, it's about a two minute video. And we use that through targeting options and, and YouTube ads just to play in front of the northern, you know, a, a very specific yeah. geographic targeting area. And for anybody that is what's called, there's something else called in-market audiences. And these are people that are known to be searching for something in particular, like an in-market audience could be professional services, uh, home, home and garden, roofing services, right? And so if you select that, that targeting group, those are people that have actively been searching for roofers or reading, roof, you know, roof repair or home improvement magazines and that kind of stuff or blogs online and that kind of stuff. And so this video now plays in front of any video. It doesn't matter what they're looking at on YouTube. They're, they're going to potentially see this ad that's saying, Hey, you know, uh, this roofing company's been named best of the best in Virginia. One of the highest rated uh, of all times, blah, blah, blah. If you have any roofing issues, give us a call. That might not necessarily convert into a, a direct lead at that moment, but what that does is it creates brand recognition, right? Right. So the more you see that ad, the more you see, when, whenever the roof does leak and it's time, you know, it could be a year from now, whatever, whenever the roof does leak, that person's going to say, oh yeah, I keep seeing that ad from, you know, roof.net or whatever the company is. And I'm, I'm going to go look them up online and they just go search for that brand. Instead of searching for roofers in my area, they search specifically for that brand. If that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So, um, and then lastly, lastly, I, I do want to jump on one more thing about the ads platform is the Google Display Network. That's the banner ad stuff. It used to be banner ads were difficult to do. Um, at least I thought so. Even as a, as a marketing guy, I didn't like doing banner ads. And, and one, I'm sure you've heard of banner, banner blindness. A lot of people don't click on banner ads. But number two, it used to be that you had to create all these different sizes of um, ad, ad graphics, right? The images, the creatives. Yeah. Right. And so right. you would have to create the leaderboard and then the rectangles and the, you know, the, the skyscrapers and all these different sizes. And so if you wanted to create an ad, you would have one design made usually and all these different sizes and formats. And if you wanted to split test, you'd have to have another design made and that got to be very expensive. 
especially you had a, a graphic designer doing all this stuff for you. And it's very, very difficult and time consuming to really dial in or optimize a display ad campaign. However, Google, again, has gotten really, really good recently in now that they have what they responsive display ads that it will create for you. And all you do is go in and upload a number of images, um, it, as many as you want, um, and it, it, it'll allow you to crop them in square format as well as rectangular format. And then you upload your logo and then you upload various headlines and text, right? So you get like a long headline, you get, uh, or excuse me, headline, which you could put up to five versions. You get a long description, then you get multiple shorter descriptions that you can, like up to five that you can add. All these different things that you add is text-based. And what Google will do is it will start creating ads from those images, as well as all those different lines of text that you put in there. It will start testing them over time, start serving those ads, and which, and over time it will start to learn through AI, right? Artificial intelligence and machine learning it will start to determine which combination of images and text are producing the best results, the highest click-through rates. And it will start to display those more. And you can actually go into the Google Display Ads dashboard and it will say like this, it'll, next to each line of text and next to each image, it will say the performance level, good, poor, uh, you know, okay, that kind of stuff. So you can go back in and eliminate the ones that are performing poorly and change it out, swap it out with a different line of text or a different image. So you can really start to optimize your campaign and you don't need a graphic designer to do this anymore. You can do this yourself or, you know, again, somebody in house. And what's great about it is if you're not using Google remarketing, right? Remarketing is like retargeting on Facebook, which means if anybody lands on your website and then they leave and they haven't converted into a lead or, you know, a phone call or made a product purchase or whatever your conversion goal is on your website, if they haven't converted, but they've landed on your website and then they leave, well, now you can, you, you know, you can cookie them and have these banner ads follow them around. Just like I know if you go to Amazon and you see something on Amazon, you check out the product page, but you don't buy it, you know you're going to see that ad for the next week <laughs> everywhere you right. go. Exactly. That, that's a great way to, again, build brand recognition and to get people back to the site to complete that conversion goal that they didn't complete. Um, and even if they don't convert right away, like I said, it's a branding tool. You start to get in front of them and they see your logo, your, your message over and over and over again to where when they are ready to make that purchase decision, they're going to think about you. And that remarketing ads are so much cheaper than cold traffic ads because they expressed an interest in your brand by at least landing on your website. So Google allows you to purchase those clicks for a much cheaper price than if you're buying cold traffic. Oh, I see. So... Google is, is connecting, this comes into the relevancy mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, that's so important for Google that, that if you're um, choosing something that is, you know, relevant to what you do and Google's watching what sort of traffic it's getting, then it learns that that's the kind of thing that people are seeking yeah. out for right, you, right? So, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And that's my point. Like, again, you can use that data. I mean, Google's using that data, right? And that's, that's where yeah. as, us as business owners, we can use that. We can advertise by selecting those segments of data that are relevant to us and our products and our services so that we're only serving ads to those people that have expressed an interest. It doesn't even have to be our site. So for example, let's say you, you sell a competing product to a, you know, a product similar to one of your competitors and that there's a, a, you know, a Google user out there that has gone to your competitor's website. Well, now you can access that, that, that person, that individual, that consumer by targeting them because Google has put them in a bucket, so to speak, that they're known to be interested in this particular product or service. And so now you can select that bucket, right? That targeting bucket. And now you can get your ads in front of them. And then, like I said, and then they land on your site and you remarket to them and you can use the same remarketing list. So once they land on your site, your whatever product page, you can, you can get really granular in how you remarket. But if they land on your site, now you cookie them and now you can remarket to them with their display ads, which are incredibly easy to do now. Anybody can do this. I'm not kidding. You don't need a graphic designer to do it. All you need to do is come up with calls to action, lines of text and some images that you want to use. Uh, or you can, you can even retarget or remarket to those people on YouTube. So like, they landed on a page on your site, but they didn't convert, they didn't buy, they didn't become a lead, whatever the case may be. And now they're on YouTube later on and a video pops up and it's like, hey, I know you visited whatever.com and it must be, but you, but you didn't make a purchase, you know, go check it out. Right now we've got a sale going on, something like that. And so 
you work, put all these pieces together, right? Between Google search, all the Google free products that we talked about earlier, then the power of YouTube and Google display network and remarketing. And you put all those things together and like, it's almost like you, Google has no choice, but to really send you a ton of traffic because you're using all their tools and you have all this power at your fingertips because of all the data that they collect, you know? That's just crazy. It's Almost just scary. getting crazier and crazier. It is a little scary. I, I'm with you on that one. I, I, you know, I mean, I love all this information that you shared. And like I said, I took notes because I, th this is just incredibly valuable information that I would bet the vast majority, if not like 99% of the listeners do not know. Yeah. So I, I can't thank you enough for sharing. This well, it was my pleasure. As you can tell, I, uh, I kind of enjoy this stuff too. I get real. Yeah. About it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. I know this. Uh, will you tell the listeners how they can find you and, and uh, you know, what you've got going on. So they have sure. other questions sure. they can get well, an answer. We created a specific um, welcome page for your podcast listeners. So if you go to semanticmastery.com slash a Y B G for accelerate your business growth, um, again, semanticmastery.com slash a Y B G that'll take you to where you can, download some free stuff that, uh, you know, just swap your email for some free stuff that we'll give you. Also, we do host a weekly webinar series on YouTube. Uh, you know, I just talked about how much I love YouTube and, uh, yeah. we, we actually did episode 244 yesterday. It's called hump day hangouts. We do it every Wednesday at 4 PM Eastern. Um, and it's one hour of Q and a it's available to the public. Anybody can come check out and post questions about digital marketing, whether you're an aspiring, consultant or an agency owner or even a local, you know, a business owner, excuse me, I said local, but a business owner that just wants to know more about specific marketing questions that you're having. Uh, you can go to Semantic Mastery um, YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash Semantic Mastery or, and check out our Hump Day Hangouts, search our channel. We've got over thousands of videos on there of questions and answers. And you can most likely find an answer to whatever question you have already. And if not, you can post your question on our weekly webinar page and we will answer it live on the webinar and you can watch it on the replay if you can't make attend live. That's awesome. What a great idea. It's great. It's really cool. And by How the way, do you build I, an audience for that. Well, it's curious. over time. Um, you know, yeah. most of the people we find uh, that like, subscribe to our channel or end up becoming, you know, buying our, our, our training products or our done for you services uh, typically find us organically on YouTube, but, uh, you know, what we've been doing, like I said, 244 episodes and we actually have, it's an hour long, but we have a, you know, a, an assistant or somebody in house that actually takes our videos and we get them transcribed and then she chops them up and into individual questions and answers and it uploads those as individual Q and A videos to our YouTube channel with the transcription underneath. And so it just, we've got just literally thousands of videos on our channels and it, it, it's been a powerhouse for us in developing an audience. Oh my gosh, I'll bet. Another great idea. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. This is so great. And listeners, uh, I, you know, I always like to thank you too. This was an episode where I hope you were taking notes like I was. And the good news is if you weren't, you can listen to it again. And you can go to um, Semantic Mastery a YouTube channel and start hanging out there and getting answers to questions or just, you know, reach out to, to Bradley and his crew. Uh, and I would like to thank our sponsor, audible.com. If you would like to get a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audio book, please go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, Goodbye and good day.